Okay, hello fans of the RPG FNAC show, and welcome to this, um, I guess it's kind of going to be a review for Indie Game the Movie. Um, now me and Oscar, uh, OG from OriginalGamer.com, went to South by Southwest, ba -da, and we watched a screening for Indie Game the Movie. And uh, I don't want to talk about the controversy surrounding the film. Um, there's been a couple things that two of the subjects have said uh, of the documentary, John Blow and uh, Phil Fish, about Japanese games. And <laughs> I don't agree with it. I don't want. I, I don't agree with it. Yeah, this is what I'm going to say, okay? People who are very good at making games, which I do believe that they are, don't necessarily know that much about what kind of games are out there. Um, it seems clear to me that. These guys have really invested almost all of their time and energy into making their own games for, like, years, and probably haven't played a lot of their titles that we know about. So, you gotta take some of their stuff with a grain of salt. Uh, I don't agree with it, I don't want this to be the purpose of the review, so we won't talk about it from then on. Uh, I think that the film is really great, uh, Indie Game the Movie. Uh, firstly, I think the cinematography is fantastic. There's only one spot of the film that I actually saw any, like, autofocus blurring going on, which is really a testament to the quality of the cinematography, because it was pretty much filmed by one person, I guess. There's only um, two people that made the whole film. Uh, it's really great. Uh, I'm jealous, actually, of the cinematography level that was done. Just, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful film. And it's really important, actually, because the subject matter isn't that cinema uh, cinematic. It's uh, 2D platformers. Um, it's not really cinematic. Uh, a lot of people, you know, anybody who watches lots of game videos can see, that's hard to get to, uh, to a general audience. I mean, if you ever try to show like an angry video game uh, nerd video to someone who doesn't play games at all, they're probably bored out of their minds. Yet, I think that this film has that kind of mass appeal because of the way that it was shot. That you could show it to somebody who doesn't know anything about games, doesn't like games, and they can still identify with the characters and stay, uh, pay attention because of the, the, the craft that was used in cinematography. You really gotta, really gotta watch it. Like, I wish I could show you examples and stuff, um, but it's not out yet. But, a fantastic film. You really gotta watch it, if nothing else, for the cinematography. It's fantastic. Uh, very good production values. Uh, like I said, sound is good, music is good. Um, it's a great film. Uh, there are a couple of quibbles that I have with the plot, uh, but I should talk a little bit about the plot before I talk about those quibbles. Basically, it follows three teams of uh, designers. Uh, one was actually, two of them are actually solo designers, and then there's Team Meat who did Super Meat Boy. Uh, those guys actually think are the most interesting of the bunch, um, and a lot of the film does center around them. It talks a bit about John, uh, John um, Blow's braid uh, at the beginning, but not so much toward the end. Um, but he had a lot of success, obviously, he had a very interesting um, game that he made. Uh, what I find really interesting, though, is once it goes out and it's successful, how his um, disagreement really with how people were playing with the game. There's a scene where some rapper, I can't remember what the rapper's name was, uh, but he was like, you know, on YouTube, he's like, hey man, check this out, you know, it's so freaking hilarious, this game's so stupid. And then the guy's just sitting there watching this and he's like so depressed because people aren't getting his game. And that really is a hard thing to do when you're a creator, to have to see people take your baby that you spent so much of yourself into making for so long, and then them to totally not get the point of what you're made. That's really hard. Um, pill to swallow. And I thought it was uh, very touching, really, to watch his reactions to that and hear his thoughts. Even if I don't completely agree with his interpretation uh, and uh, how upset he was that, you know, he's making all this money and people were still, you know, playing his game. I liked it though. It was very, uh, very entertaining and very touching. And I, I felt a connection to the person, which is, you know, another thing that's really great with films is that uh, if the film can't get you to connect with the the characters in it, it's a bad film. And this really did. I think when I looked around the audience, looked at their people, their faces and stuff. Uh, a lot of people that weren't even like gamers. Like there was a really old woman who was sitting right next to me in the screening with one of her friends who was also old. And they had to be like somewhere in their seventies or eighties. You know, and they were laughing at all the right parts. And they were, you know, kind of coming to tears at all the right parts. So I think it really has a universal message, this story about uh, game designers who are trying to make it in the world. And it follows them as they go, and they're in, like, crunch time. They're trying to get their games ready for Xbox Live. Uh, Fez, obviously, we know, hasn't made it 
yet to the um, actual commercial stage. Uh, but his journey is actually really interesting because it talks about um, how things have gone so wrong for him. Um, like even he's there at PAX trying to set up his gear and the version that he's showing uh, wasn't tested that well and it was just constantly crashing uh, on him when he was trying to show it to people. But some people were still liking it, but you could definitely see his frustration. And there was a minor subplot where he uh, previously, uh, Phil Fish, he had a partner who was working with him on Fez. And this other guy doesn't no longer wants to be part of that partnership, but he owns part of the game and he had to get him to sign this contract where he can't show it at PAX and so forth. And uh, the guy doesn't reveal who he is. I'm not going to say who he is. Um, but I, I, I think this is a weak area of the film because you don't ever get to see his side of the story. It's just always, he's always represented as this anonymous, uh, shadowy figure lurching, you know, over the shoulder of Phil Fish. And we don't get to see his side of the story. Like, why is he breaking away from it? You know, I, I assume that there's some sort of drama. I don't know whose fault it is. Obviously can't make any assumptions, but it's a weak area of the film that his side of the story never gets told on why um, he doesn't want to work with uh, Phil Fish anymore. Ultimately, he does sign over the contract and everything is, is good, but uh, that was just an, uh, one of my big quibbles with the film. The second one um, is actually, it doesn't, even, it doesn't even really matter, it's just another one of these things that they said uh, in the film. I think it was um, John Blow, he said, that Steam was really what took off the indie game revolution, you know, with now people could actually download games online. That's not actually the truth. For a long, long time, I think pretty much since the internet's existed, even before, really, if you look at Play-Doh, people have been downloading indie games, games made by small teams of people. Uh, that's always been part of the indie game movement. It's not something that Steam invented. It's not something that Xbox Live invented. It has always been that way. Maybe now it's more economically feasible to make a living with it? I don't know. Um, if you look at online game development, where like MMOs, almost all of them, um, and the uh, Korean side of things, they've all been downloaded clients. And a lot of them have been created by very small teams who make a great game, and then a big conglomerate like uh, Nexon, for example, or NCSoft, buys them up. But it's always really been the indie scene with the downloading. So that was just something that I thought um, wasn't well thought out on his behalf to say, and I don't think that if it was me, I wouldn't have put it in the film because it's factually untrue. Um, but again, it's not really about a factually, uh, the film is not supposed to be factually true about what they're saying. It's supposed to be factually true about what they're experiencing and how the uh, designers think. And in that regard, it's a very accurate film and I very much enjoyed it. And I think uh, everybody should watch it, everybody. And he gave the movie, when it comes out, I'm not really sure when it comes out, but you should definitely watch it because it's a fantastic film, um, and it will make you think, and it'll make you, maybe it'll make you cry. There are some sad parts to it, um, but there's a lot of happy ones too. So definitely check it out, guys. It's a fantastic film. If I gave ratings, I would give it a high one, so I'll just give it a thumbs up. Two thumbs up. Isn't that trademarked? <laughs> Sorry, Ebert. <laughs> Laters, guys, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey, kiddies, it's me, the Student Zor, co-host of the RPG Fanatics show, and all of this other stuff on this channel. Anyway, why don't you take a look at some of these other videos done by the RPG Fanatic, Kerry Martell himself. How about it? Also, like and subscribe to our channel for great justice!